Olá, muito boa tarde a todos. É, gostaria de convidar a, a todos que, que, que podem ter o prazer de nos assistir para ver agora uma live com Alexander Carr, o espala da Orquestra Sinfônica de Dallas. É um, um grande prazer tê-lo como convidado hoje. E, ah, Alex is already there, so let's, let's invite him. just waiting for him to be on and yes we have a connection how are uh, you man th thank you so much i'm fine thanks thanks to everything here um of, of this social distancing we we are keeping here in brazil you're still healthy and and fine i'm at home with my husband and five dogs and two Fantastic. birds I'm yes and how are you healthy i'm good Indiana is somewhat steady right now in the craziness of all that's going on, but I'm uh, kind of, right now, everybody's healthy, my family's healthy, I'm healthy, so far so good. That's, that's very good to, to hear. Uh, congr let's congratulate uh, our, our, uh, all the mothers of today, because it's Mother's Day, and I didn't, exactly. didn't think about it before we arranged this, this live, but thank you so much for being here. It's an honor for me, a pleasure. I already told you, I'm slightly petrified. <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, I mean, you are, you are, um, and let me uh, use this to introduce you a little bit. You are concertmaster of the concertmasters, uh, such an amazing violinist. You, you have been concertmaster of the Royal Concert Cabal for almost 10 years, from 96 to 2006. You are currently since uh, 2011 in, in Dallas uh, with, uh, is Yap still conducting? Not anymore, actually, no. Fabio Luizzi now. Ah, Fabio Luizzi, yeah, he left for the Metropolitan. Or New York Philharmonic. New York Philharmonic, right. right. Um, so you have an amazing experience to tell us and I'm sure all our, uh, our colleagues and, and young uh, violinists would love to know lots of advices from you today. Sure. And yes, well, um, you, have, you have studied in, 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 in Juilliard and in Curtis Institute, in Juilliard with Sally Thomas and in uh, Curtis with Aaron Rosen, mm -hmm. such an amazing violinist. He was incredible. Uh, incredible, yes. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your um, study routine? What... Um, uh, violin, is, uh, violin for starters, you know, for, for these young students who are starting now, what do you do? What shouldn't you do? Who do you listen? How to cope with uh, the amount of information we have nowadays also on internet? So right. many different right. views. What I'm, what I'm finding most these days, I'm, I think that I can't stress enough that the, how the person is set up. I think that is one of the most important things you can really start with with a violinist. And what's interesting is I've been seeing all these student concerti, you know, and they're all in the first position, which is actually interesting because I find first position the most difficult by far yeah. with the setup. If I was going to write a student concerto, I'd probably write it in third or fourth position, a little higher where everything is more natural. Everything is a little bit more basically where the, 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 the chin acts as sort of a counterbalance. So everything is more stable because out in first position, everything's much more difficult and there's much more room to wiggle around in first position in order to make things happen. So I actually would start people in third or fourth position, to be honest. Um, but the setup is so important. I find one of the things that I'm having to cope with with students is to com I have to completely change the way they've been set up in order for them to be more pragmatic about how they play the violin. The, heart the violin is hard enough as it is. We know the yeah. repertoire itself, just the speed, the, 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 the fact that it's an instrument of centimeters and millimeters. And so there's such an exactness that's, that's required in playing the instrument that having a great setup is like, first of all, basic. So the, mm -hmm. one of the first things I talk about with violinists is making sure that the wrist is slightly more out so that the, they can get a feeling of being over the notes rather than being behind the notes. It's, uh. the, there's a certain amount of weight that's necessary to stop the note. And I find what people, first of all, they're not getting enough weight into the string. 
and they're not getting it uh, in the most easy fashion. And so that's, first of all, just how I get my students to just, you know, little things like keeping the fingers down uh, as often as they can, uh, getting more of a drop from here so that you get more weight by, by using the force of the acceleration. Uh -huh. Stupid little things like that. You know, the, the weight is necessary. How you get the weight, that's intelligence. I think I probably have to translate this because uh, if there is anybody who doesn't understand English, um, I'll have to translate this a little bit. Sure, please. Uh, uma, uma das coisas muito importantes que o professor Carr falou é a, a forma como a gente toca, é, ele dando conselhos para jovens estudantes de violino, que a técnica básica tem que estar em ordem. Então, primeira coisa é como a, a, qual é a relação das suas mãos, né? É, ele acha, inclusive, que começar um concerto de estudante que está sempre na primeira posição, talvez seja... É, complicado demais, porque a primeira posição é, ela é maior, ela não é, é, aumenta a sua mão, seria mais didático começar uma, um estudo na terceira ou quarta posições onde as coisas são muito mais naturais. Um, e outra coisa é como os seus dedos caem na corda, qual é a, o distanciamento e da onde vem a... Um, o impulso para bater o dedo na corda. Agora, quanto de força que isso é usado, então está aqui na inteligência do estudo. So, thank you. Uh... Of course. No, I just think it's interesting that, you know, the violin is physics and athletics. And I don't think that people realize that the actual physics of how the instrument works. For instance, this is something that seems so stupid when you think about it, but no one ever thinks about it. So when in, in English, when we say putting the finger into the string, we call it stopping a note. All right, yeah. What we don't think of is what do we stop? We stop vibration. If we don't stop the vibration, where does the vibration go? All the way the length of the string. And on the other side is the bow. So now we're trying to make a competing vibration against this competing vibration. And they cancel each other out, which is why if there's not enough weight in the left hand, we lose bow control as well. Ah. All of these stupid things that we never think about, but it's so basic. And it's funny, somebody just, right, somebody just said, basics are, are the basis of everything. And that's the thing. Yeah. When we, I was telling this to my friend David Cooper the other day. Basics, the thing about something that's fundamentally difficult on an instrument. Let's say, let's take a piece like, um, what's very difficult? Um, well, Last Rose or, or Paganini. Okay, what's difficult? Sometimes it's, it's stretches. Sometimes it's speed. Sometimes it's string crossing. Sometimes it's playing more than one note at the same time. Okay, but what makes them so difficult? What makes them difficult is that it, takes, it makes it more difficult to, to basically keep the fundamental basics of our instrument. The things that make us sound good. The weight of the left hand. The shape of the left hand. The height of the arm. Um, how much the, the balance between the weight and the speed. All these things are much more difficult to maintain when there are so many more variables. And that's what people don't realize. If we keep, if we maintain the fundamentals of violin playing through the difficulties, that's what makes it more possible. And I think that's what people don't get. Exactly. We have the tendency to adjust our holding position to difficulties instead of using your fundamentals approach to manage those difficulties and exactly. then change the way you think about the difficulties, right? Yeah. Uh, well, that was uh, mind-blowing already. Thank you. Oh, sure. But uh, you know, it's so fun. What I, what I find is the more that I practice the fundamentals, and it's funny, right now, in this time period, when there's, we really have nothing to do, <laughs> you exactly. Know, I'm in concerts to prepare for. Now is the perfect time. I was going through Bach and Isai and, and Paganini and just, just taking the time to go through it slowly, maintaining all the things, the fundamentals throughout all those difficulties. And it's amazing just how much easier. Of course, it's difficult repertoire, but it gets easier and easier when you realize, oh, all I have to do is just keep this going, no matter what, to keep my fundamentals the basic things that are the elements of the instrument, 
If I can keep those through, it's amazing how much better they get and how much exponentially get, they get better. So Absolutely. fast. Yeah. Uh, you, you said about, uh, talked about Isai. Well, he has uh, some fundamental exercises that are contained in all of his six sonatas. Right. Do you know these exercises? You know? And then you put a finger at a time. And exactly. This is, this is basics for everything, you know? And you can do in each position and going up and down and, and well, it's string crossing, legato. Yeah. Um, preparing for each note, you know? And, and, and knowing your intervals. So th that's it. Yeah. We almost you know, don't need anything. What you just said about practicing legato. I cannot stress how much I practice legato. And I'm talking about, let's say I'm playing Paganini Moro Perpetuo. I will practice everything slurred. Everything. Everything. Because it forces the left hand to play legato, which exactly. we never do. Yes. And we have to. So I practice every difficult passage, whether it's in Bach, Paganini, anything that's fast or string crossings or Schumann scherzo. I practice everything slurred. Slurred. Yeah. And then you take the slurs and your left hand is legato, but here. Mwah! And it's I so knew. funny because it gets better. People always think that playing like Schumann scherzo or Paganini or Perpetual, that it's so difficult with the right hand. But it's not. It's here. It's here that's exactly. so difficult. Yes. The Schumann scherzo is fascinating because there's so many half steps, so many shifts, so many string crossings, so many strange intervals, half steps, then augmented seconds, and all these little weird things. That's what's hard. And that's what makes this difficult. Exactly. Uh, Alex, now let's, let's think about one thing. Studying in, in legato, mm -hmm. invariably, you get um, to hear the shifts. You have mm -hmm. portamenti or glissandi when, when you shift. Because it's glued, you know? Of course. I see so many people afraid of shifts, of making glissandi while shifting, because of course uh, it's out of taste, etc. We have to counterbalance this. But when I believe, when we are searching for basics, the shifts are in there, you should hear the glissandi, which will help you to get to know where you're going at, right? Of course. And then take it out after. Of but even taking it out, what's interesting is if something is fast enough, you don't even you have don't to take it. it out. You don't hear it. It's too fast to hear. And the first thing I'll do to try to hide a shift is just put it later. The later you put it, the less you hear it. And yes. most of the time I can cure it with just that. Sometimes I can cure it by hiding it with a bow change. With the bow change. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't search for getting rid of the shift immediately. In fact, that's the last thing I'll do. I'll try to fix it any other way. If I can connect something, I do. And, and that'll be the last thing to hide it with, like, with lightness and doing something like that. That'll be the last thing I try. Because yes. if I can make, just like you just said, if you can make that connection, that's the best way of doing it, by far. I agree with you completely. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, talking about connections now, um, you're, you're seeing such a, a amazing things um, that I, I have to ask, did you learn this from Professor Rosen or did you learn this at a younger age or did you learn this from uh, in your professional uh, career? After I having say, this. No, I didn't. I learned from Mr. Roseanne. I learned the first thing I learned from him is he set a standard. Ah. Every time that man picked up the violin, it was, I can't even tell you. Can you imagine going into your violin lesson every week? Yeah. This guy picks up the violin and just doesn't miss. And I know. Plays, and knows <laughs> every piece by heart, every piece by memory anything you could possibly and in fact his students all of us would would try to like find pieces that he wouldn't know so we would bring in things like i brought in this piece by samuel gardner called from the cane break 
And I thought, there's no way the guy knows it. <laughs> put it on the stand. By memory, he knew it. No way, no way. Yes. Everything but by memory. I remember my, my time when I was studying in Rotterdam after The Hague. Um, I studied f five or six years in The Hague and then three more in Rotterdam mm -hmm. with Andra Schifra and uh, Jean-Jacques Kantorov. Oh, I love Jean-Jacques. And Jean-Jacques was like this, you know? Yeah. Uh, you put something there and he said, oh, oh, let me see. Oh, oh this, uh, I, hadn't I haven't studied this in a long time. And then he plays it by heart with octave dead, you know, fingered octaves and everything, you're like, oh. well, anyway. <laughs> I remember, most thing I remember about Jean-Jacques is, is speeding around the south of France in his MG. Now that oh. was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy is fantastic. Also an inspiration for so many of us, right? Oh, fantastic violinist. But and so many colors. Oh, was that? So many colors. Oh, he was wonder he's a wonderful violinist. I mean, Jean-Jacques is an artist. I love, and I love playing for him in Nice. You know, it's, it's, and that's where Roseanne and Jean-Jacques, everybody was down in Nice at the, at the festival. So we all got yeah. to know each other really well. It was one, and Vladi Mendelssohn, and oh, it was just an incredible group, but. Yeah, that festival is, is one of the, the very best. Oh yeah. But I mean, the you know. Artistic like, director, the artistic director was the pianist, right? Um, um, Jean. Yes, it's exa uh, it was, uh, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Husband of Olga Martinova. Right, exactly. But you know, it's it's so funny that that you know, um, I think I learned most of what. Actually, I'll tell you, there was a point where I felt like when I started teaching, that I felt like I everybody I learned a lot by imitation by imitating people. But the problem yes. is, is that that only got me to a certain point, and I needed to be able to tell my students. Not just because I didn't want them, I didn't want clones. I wanted them to understand how the instrument worked because I needed to understand how the instrument worked. So I started reading every treatise I could on the violin, every book you could possibly think of. And what I found was most of them were kind of bullshit. And, and that's what I, I and, and what I, and it was interesting because there were, there were lots of ideas and there were always these gems. In every book, there was a gem, like in Menuchen's book. It's a fantastic thing where he puts his arm against the wall and he says, you yeah. should be able to vibrate without hitting your hand against the back of the wall. I thought that genius, absolute genius, because that shape keeps you forward, keeps the weight on the finger, keeps the, the flesh of the finger on the string. By accident, he gets all the things at once in one motion. Brilliant. They're always in Leopold Mozart, which I find is one of the best books by far. The art of the violin, I think, is genius. Not for the bow mm -hmm. arm, because it's a different bow, but for the left hand, genius. So all the, I started reading physics books mostly, just reading about the propagation of waves, about how sound travels, about how to make sound, about how the physics of the violin worked. And that's how I started thinking about, about technique and how it should work. And then I just started watching every great violinist, all of them. I watched Oystra, Milstein, Stern, Heifetz, um, and all of them of today, James Ennis, Hilary Hahn, Leonidas Kavakos, I mean, uh, Frank Peter Zimmermann, Lisa Batashvili, um, uh, God, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Janine, of course, I, I knew her when she was little. But I mean, all these great violinists, and not what they do differently, but what they all do the same. Mm. That's how I started developing my way of teaching. Uh, that's amazing you say about physics, because uh, let me just get one thing. Sure. Uh, when, when you have, you know, the violin, and we pass the, the, um, the bow on the string, well, the string vibrates this way, right? Yep. As closer to the belly of the, the wave, mm -hmm more movement you have on the wave, the closer your bow gets, it kills more the sound, right? right. So we have to go more close to the notch of, yeah. the, of the wave mm -hmm. so that it's free to wave, right? Exactly. So as close as you can from here. 
Well, and that's the thing is that it's, there's always the thing about friction and speed. There's always the balance between friction and speed. And exactly. when, they, when we play loudly, okay, playing loudly, you want the wave to be like this, right? Well, that, that does need a certain amount of bow. Without a certain amount of bow, there's no wave motion, right? No. Now, right. without a certain amount of friction, there's no depth to the sound. There's no core to the sound. So yeah. you're always maintaining that balance between friction and speed. And sometimes being as close as possible is the best thing. Sometimes being out slightly away from it gives you a, uh -huh. a less friction with you. You can use more bow. It's yeah. all about maintaining balance. And, and when you can do that, then you'll have ultimate control over the instrument. And, what, and, and that's when you look at great violinists, it's the control they have the control they have over, oh, and here's a different point. When it comes to that contact point or whatever, sound point, contact point, I call it friction point. The thing is, is that that will, that will fluctuate with weather. With, I mean, if you go into Minnesota from Brazil, Brazil, you could go right to the bridge and love it all day long because the humidity, the violin's more open. If you go to Minnesota where the violin tip tightens up, try to go to the bridge in the same setup, uh-uh, not going to work. Yeah. So it's yeah. even there, every single plan that a violinist has to come up with has to have mm -hmm. this much flexibility, you know? Well, there you have it, flexibility. That's, I think, the most important word for us, be flexible, right? Yeah. And it comes then to, to a subject that I love, which is our uh, profession, to playing orchestras as well, you know. Uh, you are an all-round violinist. You teach, you are a soloist, but you also play in orchestra as a concertmaster, as a leader. Um, and I think, I heard you, you saying to, to Hilary uh, Hahn in one of uh, your interviews, I love that interview, actually. Congratulations to both she's of you. She's really good at that, actually. <laughs> Man, she's fantastic. I yeah. watched it in the what can I ask him? She asked everything, you know? <laughs> well, being flexible, as well as a, being a facilitator, you use this word a lot, is crucial to us. But now, here comes my question. We already know about leadership, and we, we know being a concert master, etc., cetera, et cetera, but the thing is, and I think it's most difficult job, is to follow, to be humble, to listen, to learn. That's most difficult. Giving orders is easy. Sure. Right? Of course. So, how did you learn the job of being concert master? I guess the answer is by sitting next to one or, or just being there. You can't, I mean, it's funny. My personality, I love people. So that does make it a lot easier. In certain ways, my personality lends itself to be around people. I kind of like leading people. I've, I'm a kind of a, you know, I'm an extrovert, big personality. But I'll tell you one thing, being in Holland, uh, if you want humility, you'll learn it quickly. Yes. <laughs> I was very young. I mean, I was, my first job, I was 22. So I was just, you know, I was, you know, and then I went to Charleston, South Carolina for my second job. And, and I was kind of a big personality and I learned a lot about from my colleagues about, you know, just basic things about playing in an orchestra, you know, just, but I have to say my first job was playing in a chamber orchestra where we did a lot of things conductorless. So uh -huh. body motions, you know, all that kind of stuff. I really learned there because I, I was forced to be able to lead an orchestra uh -huh. without anyone in front of me. So that I learned a lot of the body motions. I also, I dance, I'm Cuban. So I love dancing. So having a control over my body, you know, is really important. And it actually makes this kind of, of leading much easier. But then I, went, then I went to Cincinnati and I really learned a lot about how an orchestra of that stature function, about protocol, about how to address an orchestra, how to speak to an orchestra, how to be, you know, a, a good colleague. And then in Amsterdam, I learned humility and I learned it big. Um, in a, is a very much the Dutch culture is one where, you know, they say, if you stick your head above the sand, it gets cut off. And so yeah. I had to, as an American, 
with this such big personality, I came into a place that was historically one of the three best orchestras in the world. And yeah. I remember turning around the first time to change a Boeing and somebody asked why. Oh, and yeah. I just thought, ow. <laughs> you know? And yeah. so I, know. I started learning, you know, to, to first earn the respect of the orchestra, earn respect of my colleagues, and then, then to really, I should like, then once I'd learned how to get that, that respect by just leading by example, then I could really exert influence. Bravo. But I really had to have that step first. And I think that, that people don't realize, you know, the first thing to do when you get into an orchestra like that is to, to just get the lay of the land. Get to know your colleagues. Get to know what you're, before you start opening your mouth, get to know what your colleagues are capable of. Get to know the kinds of mistakes they usually make and the ones that get fixed and then the ones that don't. Because sometimes you don't have to open your mouth at all in a rehearsal, and sometimes you do. And so to first, to get the, 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 the idea of, okay, these are what my colleagues are usually like. Then after that, once you've earned their respect by playing your solos well, leading well, being consistent in the chair, then you can start saying to yourself, okay, how can I mold the section into one like, that's more flexible or more interesting or more outgoing or, or the opposite, more elegant? How can you do that? And so that's, I, but that comes later. That comes after you've really had time to grow with the group itself. Exactly. When, when you have time to know everybody, to learn from each one of them, um, I sometimes I think that the strength of the group is as strong as the weakest link. Mm -hmm. It's true. You, know, uh, you have to manage everything, thinking about every level, even yep. if it's in, in a very high level. But every everybody has ups and downs, mm -hmm. uh, and so for for a group to function well uh, and properly function you know you have everybody has to play the same the same way the same place of the bow uh, with the same intensity and and belief in what they are doing because yes. if, if they are doing what you want but not believing in it then it's also not a problem. well um what do you think about ethics and and moral in in working then with uh your colleagues, how should we uh, address uh, colleagues and conductors and guests and, and et cetera? Um, also, maybe do you have any, have you had any experience with bullying in the orchestra? Does it yeah. happen? Yeah, I've, I've been in orchestras that luckily I have not faced much of that. I've, I've, I've sensed a little bit, you know, like, people telling people they can't move or people telling this or this or that. I try to nip that in the bud really quickly with any group I'm in. I don't like, mm. I don't like that kind of mentality. I mm -hmm. think that everybody brings their strengths and their weaknesses to the table. The most important, it's basically we want to enhance the strengths and hide the weaknesses. That's very exactly. simple. Now, when it comes to ethics, ethics, I think that number one, my ethic about talking, I address, and the golden rule, I believe, is the, the greatest rule you could ever have. Treat others as you would have them treat you. With that kind of respect, if I imagine being spoken to, how would I want somebody to speak to me if I were in the back of that group? Somebody who's trained so hard their whole life, who takes their job seriously, how would I want my concertmaster to talk to me? So I think, number one, I do that. Number two, I stand up to say most of the things that I have to say to show those people everywhere they're back there that I want them to hear exactly what I have to say, that I respect them, that I don't expect them just to have it passed back to them. No, that they get it directly from my mouth, which I think is very important. Uh -huh. I also believe that I never say anything to anyone that I wouldn't say to their face. So I wouldn't say anything about anyone else in the orchestra that I wouldn't say to that person's face. So I believe that I have to be held beyond any reproach. My actions have to be transparent for anyone to see so that there's never any sense of, if you want to know what I think, ask. It's, and I'm, I'll be very open about everything I feel. And I always am. 
So I, I think that once people get to know me, they realize there's no secrets with me. I'm about as open of a book as you want. Now, I, I do keep a certain amount of distance, a certain amount, not very much. And especially luckily in Dallas, I haven't had to, to maintain too much of a distance. My colleagues, I really enjoy it. My colleagues are really good people and they're really friendly. You know, there's always that kind of like, you know, I have to sort of maintain a certain barrier, just that, that you know, there's a certain collegiality that needs to remain. However, in Dallas, not so much. I remember in Amsterdam when I was there, I got hurt a couple times. My stomach, I, mean, I remember feeling the first, I would say year or two, year and a half, it really was not easy for me. It was blending into a completely new culture, blending into a completely different way of playing, blending into a, like, it was just hard for me. And so I literally was confused for a, a good bit of just what was I supposed to do? How am I supposed to lead? This is so not me. It's not my culture. It's not anything. What can I, I mean, and I remember speaking to Hermann Krebers, who was the legendary concertmaster of the Concert Choir Orchestra, and who became a very dear friend of mine in my first years in Holland. Really good. We would go to dinners. And I remember asking him, I said, Hermann, why is it so difficult on me? Like, why are they so difficult with me? Is it because I'm American? Is it because I'm young? And he said, Alex, I was 42 and Dutch. And I felt the same thing. Yes. Because, you know, it's a very strongly opinionated orchestra. And everybody is very open about their opinions. And so I just had to get used to that and get stronger. Well, you, you know, he, he was 18, I believe, when he, or 17, 18. Well, Yap was. Herman Yap was. Yap was. Yap was 18, 19. And, but Hermann was 42. He was already, a, he had already played for years in Dutch orchestras. In the uh, Brabant Forest, right? Yeah. 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 He had played in, in Brabant, The Hague. And when Hermann got the job finally at the Concertgebouw when he was 42, he was already established as a hell of a violinist and everything. Yeah. And yet he also had the same problem. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's just, but you know, that's with, with a great orchestra like that, whether it's Berlin or Vienna or the Concertgebouw or any of the great American orchestras, they have personalities. And, and that's the one thing about being a concert master is in one of those situations, you have to have a pretty strong stomach. And, yes. And, and if you don't have one, you develop it very quickly or you run. You know exactly, yeah. You have to have stomach, uh, patience, mm -hmm. um, love for your job, love for your colleagues, gratitude, yes, humility, everything. Yeah, I think. yeah. And I think that you know, it's funny if you want to get a group of people to really play with you, not for you, but with you, with you, then yeah. the art is being able to, to open yourself up enough that they understand you and they understand that it's not about your ego it's not about you forcing an issue it's not about you making them do something no it's about asking them to trust you yes uh, almost an invitation to take part of your way of thinking about music exactly and that's why you know sometimes you when you when i speak to the section it'll be a technical thing like can we please you know be in this part of the bow or maybe, you know, take a little bit of weight off the sound or something. But sometimes it'll just be, look, can we actually imitate the flute? We're doubling the flute there. Let's try to imitate the sound of the flute. Let's try to keep underneath here. It's, it's also about in, engaging their musicianship. Because right. sometimes we just, you, you know, it's, it's funny. Sometimes orchestras end up, they can, as a group of people, you get tired. Sometimes every week that intensity, it's exhausting. And so sometimes, they get into a, a sort of a laziness of just following the conductor. That's not enough. It's about no. being a musician every week, every second, being engaged. And that's, and sometimes it's about just telling the orchestra, let's get engaged, let's really listen, let's be aware of our colleagues. And you know, some, it's, it's just human. It's human to sometimes get a little tired. It know? is, it is, yes. So it's our job to inspire, Yeah. right? Exactly. Okay help them back to our, you know, to, to the life of, of wonderful discoveries about music. Yeah. How wonderful music can be, even if you're playing that Beethoven symphony for the hundredth time, you know? Yeah. Well, um, 
uh, I was going to ask you something about uh, the balance in in the group. In the, in, you know, because you have a group of violinists. Uh, sometimes they are um, with the same school. Sometimes very different. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends from orchestra to orchestra. Uh, ages vary as well. Uh, so, how do you do? You get to say anything about where people sit, or um, they just sit where they normally sit every time? There is there a, a kind of um, uh, how do you say this? Codizio in Portuguese. Uh, Hierarchy. Change, no, changing places. Oh yeah, rotation. Rotation. Thank you. Rotation. Yeah. yeah. How do you do this? Do you think about some special player more on the back, or they're more in the middle, or more in front? Nope. nope. In Amsterdam, there was when I first got there, there was no rotation at all. Ah. So there was just they people auditioned for that place, and if they wanted to move up, they auditioned for that place. Okay. You know? So that was, and so we we began a rotation in Amsterdam, which, oh boy. That was a war in itself. I don't even want to remember that time. I, I, I went up against, oh, I, <laughs> I, I, I feel the ulcer just remembering what happened with that. I mean, I should have just shut my mouth. <laughs> Looking back, that was one of those situations I just should have shut my mouth. Well, you learned. Yeah, yeah I was young and dumb. <laughs> But now I'm not. But it's, um, right now what I believe is a section has a function. And the function yeah. is where you are in the group. And, you, and it doesn't matter how you fulfill that function, but you have to fulfill the function. So this Yap talk to, talks about a lot with how the group functions, and I completely agree with him. I think what happens is uh, the front stands always believe that they have to just be the leaders and engage and play loud and all this stuff. No, I disagree. I think that the front stands are there to lead with their body motions. The second stands are there to take that body motion and translate it back. Because most people can't even see the concertmaster in the first stand. People who can, great. But those who can't, the next two stands are really there to transmit, to be like conduits of sound and body motion, right? Now, the two leadings are from the back and the front. The front leads with motion, the back leads with sound. Because the back, what happens often when I've sat in the back, just in rehearsals for, for a certain, like in Amsterdam, we had two concert masters. So when we would go on tour, whether it was Rudolf with me, uh, with me or with Vesco, sometimes we would play the same pieces on tour and just play different concerts as concert master. So I would sit in the back, rehearse with the orchestra or Vesco would sit in the back. And what was interesting was when you sit back there, it's so much more difficult than sitting in the front. You can't hear as well. You feel like you're on an island. And so it's, it's, there's, no, there's not as much contact. So the natural reaction of sitting in the back is to get shy and just play like, but what happens is there's no sound and you're late. Exactly. So, you, you have that, that um, um, late reaction. You know that. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So there becomes an imbalance in the group. So what I find is it should go like this. Back mm -hmm. leads this, then like this. So that there's never a sense that the back actually is less sound. No, the back should be more sound even. Yeah. And then it evens out totally in the end. So leading more with motion in the front, leading more with sound in the back, and then boom, it meets in the middle. Exactly. And so <clears throat> that for me is how a group functions. So whoever you are, you, it's, like, it's like, you know, if you have a soccer team, you have the strikers, you have the midfielders, you have defense, the goalie. Everybody has their, their function and you, fit into that function. So it's not that I'm playing loud or anything. No, I am basically there to sort of serve as, again, the facilitator between the conductor and the, and, the viol and the string section and the violin section, but also between the string sections. And also I sort of act as a facilitator between the conductor and the winds and brass so that we're all on the same page. Yes, there are some people in the orchestra that, that you have to keep contact like every uh, all the time of course for your 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 first standard colleagues from from the strings right 
but also the first oboe, the first flute, the first clarinet, the timpani, the first trombone, first trumpet, first bass, you know, they're all the way behind. They're, they're so far away, but still, if you have that connection, the orchestra is much closer as an organ, a smaller organism, and you can work as if you were playing chamber music. And that, it, that, that's, it, it, you just nailed it right on the head. Playing as chamber music in an orchestra. Orchestra is just chamber music on a grander scale. On a grander scale. Is. And if people yeah. view it like that, then orchestra can be inspire, an inspiring place to work every single day. What I love sometimes is being able to look at my colleagues across the stage, and not just the principals, cello or something like that. I love being able to look across the cello section and any single person to main, like have that eye contact on a pizzicato or, or on, a, on a place where we're doubling each other or playing in, in, in unisono or something, to have that kind of contact with any one person of any group. For yeah. me, that's when you know that an orchestra is like this. There was one concert I'll never forget in the Concerto Bar Orchestra. We were on tour playing Mahler 6. Oh. And at one point, the lights went out. As in all the lights. Completely wow. pitch, pitch black. The orchestra finished off the movement. It was like a minute left in the movement. A whole minute of, of, of music. And we finished without looking at the music, without looking at a conductor, to finish the movement by ourselves. When the lights went up, we all looked at each other and just started laughing because it was amazing. Like, I just, I, I'll never forget that moment because we all just joined like this. This is magic. It was, ma it, magic was the only way to describe it. Truly the only way to describe it. And, and that's when it's chamber music. When you can go completely by memory and without seeing a thing or watching a thing with, an, with a conductor to just go completely on your hearing. Brings tears to my eyes. You know, well, yeah, it's, it's a thing. Yeah, this is a dream, right? Uh, well, do you think? Um, j let me just recompose myself a little bit here because this brings me so much memories of playing there. You know, I, I didn't play with the concert ball, but I played in the concert ball, the building itself, yeah. so many times there, playing with with the Netherlands Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, I miss that place a lot, really. But I'm also so happy to have my job here and amazing colleagues and an amazing conductor, you know. So we, we are really, I'm thankful for what I have uh, nowadays. And me too. Yeah. Well, uh, let, let's me, uh, let me think about um, one important thing. We, uh, let's go back to... Uh, some techniques on the violin. You said you said about legato and, and studying slurred and etc. Et How do we use these, of course, other techniques to sing and to speak on the violin? And I mean, say because when you teach um, in one of your videos on YouTube, you're teaching the uh, Einheldenleben solo. Mm -hmm. And you you say about, you know, here I want this start of the note, there I want a mellower, here I want this glissando. How do you use bow technique and left hand technique to sing and, uh, and to play consonants and vowels that are so important for us? What's well, funny, I had this really, so do you know, uh, synesthesia is a condition where you see colors. Yeah. I have that. So it's, wow. it's, kind of, it's kind of a strange thing when you, when you see color or I, I see um, uh, stories, like immediately, like movies, things that come to my mind immediately when I hear a piece of music. So I'll see a color or I'll hear a story or I'll, I mean, it's funny because I, 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 when I was learning the Chacon, I immediately started thinking about Hamlet. It's a really weird thing. And I started like the second chorale, I started thinking of like Ophelia, you know, and like, and, and like starting off with almost a prayer and then going crazy. And it was this, but it was a, it's this weird thing that I have in my head. So when it comes to music, I, or 
when I, I hear a piece of music or when I study a piece, I, I sort of develop an image of what I want. And the image comes for lucky, for, I'm, I'm lucky in this respect. It kind of comes quickly. I'll look at the score and I'll have an idea of what I want, of, want to approach. Then the violin then becomes a conduit. It just becomes the, the, the means at which I sort of speak. The first thing I have to establish is who's singing. What is it about, what is the mood of what it is and who is singing it? Once I've established that, then it's a series of motions that accomplish it. For instance, with the left, the, I believe that there's two things involved. There's the, the balance of weight and speed in the boat to get the color and the volumes and the dynamics that, of what I want, the phrasing of what I want. And then the left hand, it's both about the vocality of it. It's about the person's voice, whether it's a, a, a faster vibrato, if it's, if it's, and this is, again, this is, it sounds sexist, but it's more like feminine voices versus masculine voices, dark versus light, coloratura versus lyric soprano, all these things. So I don't really think violin. I think, I hear, I think voice, like I think of Pavarotti, or I think of like uh, 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 Mira da Freni, or all these different voices that come into the instrument. Then I think, okay, is this a, a I have the image in my mind, is it a wider vibrato? Is it a, is it a faster vibrato? Is it, um, what kind, is it a slower vibrato? Then I think onto this side, and all I wanna do when I practice is even if, when I start slowly, I basically try and with using certain, okay, I, don't, I call it practicing from the outsides in. I make sure my left hand weight is correct. I make sure the height of the arm is correct. And then I can experiment. Uh. Meaning I can't experiment if my left hand weight and the, and the security of the left hand isn't there. And if this isn't correct, everything else in the middle, could, is, there's too many variables. I make sure these are correct, and then I experiment with the sound. So I start by making the most important aspects of the instrument, or the ones that can easily be destroyed. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, the yeah. ones that really make you sound bad. Like, if your left hand security isn't there, I don't care what your bow arm is doing, it's not going to sound good. If this is not the right level, then the vibration of the instrument gets cut off. So therefore, you can't sound good. So I start from those points in, and then I just experiment with sound. I experiment with the color. I experiment with the vibrato. And then I have an idea. And then at that point, then I start, I work speed doesn't come from, like if you have a fast passage, you don't get it by playing fast. You get it by making all the fundamentals first and then finding the speed. But all of these things, the voice, yes, it comes from vibrato. It comes from the balance of weight and speed but I always do it from the point of fix the fundamentals and then experiment with those fundamentals. Once I get that, then I can find any voice. But when it comes to like articulations, you know, 99 out of a hundred times, you can sing something to yourself and be correct. Yeah. The natural vocality, if I start ka or ya, or if I naturally sing something like na, La da da ya da di da ya da da ya da ya da di dum. There's a natural little glissando that I want to use. So that the natural, when you think about using a a, a, a portamento, mm -hmm. you would do where you naturally sing it. And if you sing something to yourself and you don't hear the portamento, don't use the portamento. Exactly, exactly. But that's how I think about the instruments. It's so so much fun to. Um, you said you read all this these uh, treaties and books on violin and so I just remembered here you, you talking about portamento the the book of Charles de Perriot mm -hmm. you know his violin score and he he speaks about uh, Port de Voix right. on the, on the third volume I believe uh, which is about style and interpretation you know the, all the mechanics are left behind in the first two lab, uh, books and then in the third he speaks about interpretation and uh, of course, we know he was married to a soprano. Yep. Yeah? And she died uh, young, uh, unfortunately. And people say her voice entered in his violin. And whatever he played, he, her voice was, you know, in, in, into his, I believe it was a Guarnier. He had Marie Malibran, uh, you know, the, was the soprano. And his Guarnier is the, the Berriot Guarnier. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he he speaks a lot about Portevoix, the, the portamenti. Yeah. 
different ways, different velocities, and, and I said, but also about when not to do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, which we have uh, maybe um, a wrong idea about 19th century playing. That we believe that everything was all mellow and, and, and romantic, but, but no, not that much sometimes, no. right? Exactly. And I think that there's a natural quality to the human voice. There's a natural expression of the human voice. And I think that, that it's, it's trying, you know, everybody has a different ideas. That's what makes music so wonderful, is that it's, mm -hmm. there's so many different possibilities within a global spectrum of, of the, the sort of umbrella of taste. So there's uh -huh. so many different avenues, right? But organic is the word I like to use, to have an organic taste, something that feels natural, something that isn't, isn't um, manufactured, you know? Yeah. And I think that, that when I start playing a piece, one, you know, I've had certain influences in my life that were really important. For me, um, Robert Levin, the pianist and musicologist, has been a huge influence. Uh, Nicholas Harnoncourt was a huge influence on me, uh, especially during my years in Amsterdam, about talking about music in a sense of, of, of getting to know the composers themselves. You know, I remember like Bob Levin and I sitting in, um, in this hotel in Sarasota, Florida, while watching the NBA playoffs, discussing Mozart and what Mozart probably, how, what his desk probably looked like and how he would have different parts and pieces of music that he was busy with at any given point. And he would sit there and say, you know what? Hmm, that part over here would look, would be really great in the symphony. And he takes it and he moves it over here and he takes something and he starts writing it in and how he thought about music and how he organized it. The fact that Mozart would write the melody and the bass, and he would write the entire piece as far as he could go. And then he would write the middle lines. And how do you know that? By looking at the ink. Yes. Sometimes the different inks he would use. So you get this idea of how this man thought. Once you've started getting an idea of how this guy thinks, then you can start thinking, okay, this is how he, he, the importance that he puts on certain things. And then how do I relate myself to that? So when I listen, think about Brahms, I think about what he was like as a person, um, the music that he wrote, his, the traditions that he wrote, the fact that the guy never wrote anything outside of a classical period form, that he was basically thinking like Mozart, but with a chromatic eye of lengthening phrases through chromaticism. But he never, his, his basic way of writing was like Mozart. He even wrote Bogen vibrato. He wrote a bell tones by using the, 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 the sort of, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the hairpins. You know, yeah, re regulators, yeah. hairpins. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. So he thinks like Mozart. So I start thinking, oh, wow. Like when I start working on Brahms now, I don't think of Brahms as always being, you know, it's just so fat or this or that. No, I start thinking of him historically. Harun Kaur and I sat down once and he was talking to me about the Kreutzer Sonata and that the second movement was based off a strophe pattern of, of, of Goethe. And I remember thinking like, wow, like I never, at that age, I was 26, 27 years old. I never even thought on that level, never even crossed my mind thinking about music in that way. But you know, it's funny, the more and more and more I, I, I learned and learned from these people, the more influences I had of, of, of all my conductors, whether it was Yacht, whether it was Morris, whether Shai, all these, and, and Fabio now, I mean, all of these people, they had such a profound influence on me that, I mean, that's how I'd sort of develop taste and how to approach the instrument. Amazing. Well, uh, would you like to, uh, we are unfortunately coming to an end of uh, an hour of our life, which it's, uh, it's been it's a fun hour. like five minutes ago for me, <laughs> know. you know. <laughs> I'm learning so much, and I, I'm so thankful to you. Uh, would you would you care to give an, um, advice for our young uh, players and and even for me as an OD as well? Um, advice for us as how to be musicians, how to love music and never, stay in this game. Never lose your curiosity. You know the thing about about becoming a musician is you can never feel as if you've stopped learning. Every year I try to get better. Every year I try to improve something about my playing, whether it's vibrato, whether it's my setup, whether it's my relaxation, whether it's my nerve, whether it's my stomach. 
to really to, to, to learn something that makes me a better artist and to realize that success is all about being ready for the opportunity when it comes. Opportunities will come, but you have to be ready for them when they come. So it's all about learning, learning all the time so that when the next opportunity comes up, that you're ready for that opportunity. I was so lucky that these concert master positions, it's almost like they lined up for me. You know, these jobs just sort of like, Charleston was there, then Cincinnati came two years later, and then Amsterdam came two years later. And then I was, and then I was able to, to live in that position for 10 years. And then I got back to the States and you know, Indianapolis offered me the, the, the principal guest concert master position and that just came up. And then Yap called me and said, you know, I want you here in Dallas. And I thought, fantastic, okay, great. And so I was ready for that opportunity when it came up. So all of these things, you know, they wouldn't have happened if I wasn't ready for that opportunity when it came. And I think that it was, my, it's kind of the curiosity, the humility, the openness that, that makes it possible to just to become an artist. And you can't lose those things. You can't lose the humility. You can't lose the curiosity. You can't lose the drive, the need to be better all the time. And last but not least, you have to have belief in yourself, the stomach. You have to believe. You have to be able to walk out on stage and say, I deserve to be here. And that yeah. only comes with work. Yes. I hate to yeah. say it, that's the only thing that makes it happen. And it's for every position. I mean, not only for concert must for every position, you know. Of course. Uh, even if you are not in an orchestra, but you are going to play your favorite sonata with your friend. You, you believe in yourself. You deserve to be there. Uh, you are just going to share a little bit of your heart and soul with the audience. Yeah. If they like it, wonderful. If they don't like it, also wonderful, you know, but it's your, your view. You, yeah. you cannot do it thinking about, oh, what will they think about me? Then you are done. Yep, exactly. And there's nowhere to go from there. I mean, no. that's, that was one of the hard things for me to learn. One of the most difficult things to learn was, was to have the belief in myself that, that to just, it's not about, people talk about going for it. Going for it, I mean, that almost, it means that you're trying so hard. No, yeah. it's just to do what I wanted to do without any hesitation. To not let yeah. fear guide any of my actions. That my actions are going to be, we all make mistakes, it's human, unless you're like Hilary Hahn or James Ennis, and then, okay, fine. Then maybe you don't make many mistakes. <laughs> I hate them. <laughs> Actually, I love them, but they're good friends. But at the same time, you know, for those of us who are human, you know, it's, we all are human and we do make mistakes. And so that's okay to make a mistake to err is human, but to let it affect you, that's too difficult. Yes. And you have to be able to be on stage to have, I, it's funny, when you're in the practice room to have no forgiveness whatsoever, to be on stage, to have ultimate forgiveness. Yes, yes, yes. Bravo. Well, uh, those are very savvy words. Um, this was an amazing live. I don't want to stop. I mean, so do I have Thank any... you so much for having me here. No, it, it's my pleasure. Uh, and uh, I thank you, everybody who's listening to us and everybody who will listen, of course, because I will, with your permission, um, download this live and put it on YouTube. Please. So, yes, would you like me to, to do course. this? Of course. Because I think everybody can can get one or, or two uh, things to learn from and or even if they already knew, just to remember how it is to be human to be a musician and to inspire people because that's our jobs, our, uh, our mission almost, right? Very much As so. artists. Alex, thank you so much. My In pleasure. Place, my greetings to, to Hilary, who I don't know personally, but I would love to. Uh, and also to Yap, who, who I know him personally and uh, he's a fantastic guy. Well, thank you so much again. And I hope to talk to you soon later. Definitely. Take care. Bye.